So let's start with some introductions. Um, welcome everyone to this workshop, the Flight Approach Activity Design Assessment and Publication. Uh, my name is Chantelle Warner, and I'm one of the three co-presenters. Uh, Carl Blythe, unfortunately, um, could not be with us. He'll be here later this afternoon. He got stuck in Atlanta, um, and I heard a couple of participants also got stuck somewhere along the way, so I'm happy to see so many faces here. So I'll go ahead and start. So Chantelle Warner, I'm an associate professor of German and second language acquisition and teaching. I'm at the University of Arizona, so I'm one of the few people who thinks this isn't hot here in Austin at the moment. <laughs> Um, I'm also the co-director of CIRCLE, which is the Center for Educational Resources in Culture, Language, and Literacy. And uh, it's what the, part of getting the job was being able to say that quickly. Um, <laughs> and along with CORAL, who's hosting this workshop, uh, we're one of the 16 Title VI Language Resource Centers. And we'll say a little bit more about those um, later today. Um, I also direct our language program in German studies, so that for us is the first five semesters. So I train um, the graduate students who teach in that program and also do a lot of curriculum development related to that. Um, and one of my main interests, and you will see that, is in foreign language literacy and how we can develop that. So that very much ties into the theme of this workshop. All right. Julie. All righty. Good morning, everyone. And again, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we were able to get as many folks, considering that there are storm systems and all sorts of things going on around the country. So um, I'm here from Cornell, um, and I do find it very hot and very humid. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm a senior lecturer in French in the Department of Romance Studies there. Um, I've been in that department for, I guess, about 11 years. But um, my background really is uh, in ESL. Uh, so I was uh, actually, I went to, uh, to uh, Cornell about 22 years ago, uh, initially in the intensive English program. I've always worked in post-secondary uh, education. So, um, but after 9-11 they closed uh, that program because of the drop in inter numbers of international students. So I was able to morph uh, into teaching French. Uh, I've been married to a Frenchman for 32 years, lived in France, but French was not something that I was thinking professionally of, of uh, doing. Um, but my background, like many language teachers, is somewhat eclectic. So my undergraduate major um, at Barnard in Columbia was Chinese. Um, and uh, I uh, spent uh, a year there teaching English. Um, and I've taught, I taught in, uh, English in France as well. And again, always um, in either professional or um, uh, university contexts. Um, so, and so Chantel, Carl, Blythe, and myself, we are the three co-coordinators of this project. And we'll let Carl say a little bit about himself when he joins us, but he's the director of CORAL, which is the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, um, who are the hosts of this event. And he will, we have been told, be here um, by 11 o'clock today. He just got stuck along the way. Um, so we want to start by saying, um, uh, hearing a little bit about you, who's in the room. Um, then we'll do kind of an overview of the workshop, and then we're going to get started. And I think we're going to keep ourselves pretty busy today. There were a couple of things that I heard in your introductions that I wanted to kind of hold on to for a second to flag things that we're going to do. And one was that many of you are moving across different contexts. So sometimes that's different levels. Some people mentioned, well, I teach uh, whatever language one and two, but then I also do AP, or I've moved from um, this context into an immersion context. And I think that's something you're going to see that when we conceptualize, when we think about this approach, we are very much thinking about multiple levels and multiple contexts. So that's something you're going to see coming up, um, that it is adaptable to different kinds of educational contexts, different instructional contexts. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I also heard a lot of people talking about integrating reading and writing with other things, so with speaking, with technology, how to bring that into the curriculum, especially a couple of you pointed to in uh, maybe a moment where students are less likely to go out and kind of read on their own or feeling less engaged or motivated in that, so how to bring that in in a way that's engaging for them. Um, and that's something I think that also is very much what we're concerned with. Um, and then the other thing I think which is kind of important for something I want to say a couple of words about is that a couple of people were mentioning that they are their program they're their department. Um, and even those of you who are not your entire department are probably in small departments in a lot of cases. Um, or you might be the only person or one of the few people who's teaching what you're teaching. Um, and that very much is something that undergirds not just this project, but the entire philosophy and the entire mission of the language resource centers uh, like Circle and Coral. Um, because our mission is really to provide 
collaborative projects. Um, and so that's what this idea of open educational resources. Um, a couple of people already mentioned that. Um, so I wanted to highlight, just so you kind of know who we are, I won't take too much time with that, but in your folder, you have some information about Circle and about Coral, which will also point you to our websites where we have online resources. Because even beyond this project, um, our two centers and the other 14 centers provide a lot of materials for language teachers. So you'll find a lot there sometime when you get a chance to peruse the websites. Um, and this project in particular, one of our main goals and our main motivations is to create a space where we can share quality materials. So a couple of you mentioned wanting to develop lessons. That's what we want you to do too. We've planned in a lot of time to do really hands-on, supported and guided activities where you're creating things for your classroom, but also very much with the hope and the intention that you will be willing to share those materials so that no person is an island, um, but that we're rather all working together. Um, it's, it takes a lot of work, as many of you I'm sure know, to create materials from the ground up, to, to go without the textbook, or even with a textbook, to create a new curriculum. Um, so this is a way of us kind of working together and creating a community of practice where we can share those labors and share those insights and share those um, approaches and methods together so that none of us have to work alone. Um, the project flight, foreign languages and the literary, you'll, you'll hear us keep saying flight and foreign languages is, the flight is foreign languages and the literary in the everyday. So just know that that's our shorthand flight. Um, but it actually grew out of a previous project that was supported by Coral and was led by Joanna. And I'm gonna let you say a couple of words about that. Yes, so uh, about five years ago, I had contacted Carl and I, I said, you know, I'm interested because I was, um, I was actually hired um, into the Department of Romance Studies for French to coordinate the first year program. And I had done that already for, for several years. And um, I, of course, became frustrated with textbooks and, and, and with um, assumptions and, and all sorts of things. So anyway, I contacted Carl and I said, I'm interested in adopting and adapting um, the uh, open uh, French textbook that's at uh, Coral Français Interactif. And uh, it is in PDF, uh, editable PDF files. So I thought I can change the content, adapt it to my context. However, in terms of literacy, uh, uh, development, I, I wasn't satisfied. And, and so he said, great, make your own materials, create a kind of a supplement, if you will. But one thing is, I want you to share it. Whatever your results are, share it. So I began doing what we all do, is just creating lessons, finding interesting materials, et cetera, et cetera. And it began to evolve. And it turned into, in this case, a kind of a full-blown approach. And it's an approach that can be applied to any language. So um, not only uh, did I want to share it as uh, uh, just, just say, lessons that could be, that could be um, used uh, um, independently. So this is the web version, right? And these are all in Word document. They're downloadable. They're uh, free to be used, free to be manipulated in any way you wish. So all of the chapters in this textbook, this is the bundled form, uh, which can be uh, uh, sold as a textbook. Um, but uh, here is individual um, uh, documents. Uh, the only constraint is that you maintain attribution. So my name and the name of Coral, because Coral is the host, the publisher of this textbook. So um, open educational resources run quite a spectrum, and Carl will be speaking um, about that um, at the end of uh, the workshop tomorrow and really giving you an understanding of what OER means because it's a word and a concept that is used widely, but what we've discovered over time is that most people really don't quite understand what is involved um, and a lot of, there are certain assumptions, for example, that, oh yeah, it's free materials, but there is no quality control and how do I know if this is something that would be appropriate and uh, how does this fit into right, the kind of curriculum that we have? So these are the kinds of questions that we'll be answering. Uh, this project is uh, peer edited and that's part of the work that we're gonna be doing uh, with the uh, assessment uh, section. Not only how do you make a flight lesson, but how you assess, how you uh, under, uh, give feedback for someone else who may be creating a lesson and what that process is for eventually publishing your work. So it's not about getting you to publish a textbook. It's about doing what you do all the time as teachers, but bringing it to a level that um, then you can share with other people, have other people respond to, perhaps modify, um, and bring it to yet a further you know, level of, of interest and satisfaction. Just to kind of, there are a couple of resources that we want to point you to online that we're going to keep coming back to through out the workshop, um, but before I go there, actually, let me just do a really quickie, what are we doing here over the next couple of days? You have a more detailed 
agenda in your folders, I believe. Um, but really, as Joanna mentioned, um, her project, the original project um, around the literary and the everyday um, resulted in what is ultimately a textbook, although it's a textbook that's designed to be manipulated and, and tweaked in the way that we, I think, all probably tweak the textbooks that we use. Um, part of this is to lay that bare a little bit, to make that shareable. Um, I have the advantage in many ways of having a team of graduate students who are kind of limitless in terms of creative energy, but even we often need other insights, need other inspirations, and can share those things outward. So this is a project that really takes what a lot of people are already doing, builds on it further through this approach, um, and then also gives us a context in which we can share those materials. So those are the two sites I'll be showing you. What we're going to do, um, we're kind of already there, is doing the introductions. Then Joanna's going to lead us through what is the flight lesson. So this is really the what is this approach, especially for those of you who um, haven't participated in a previous professional development opportunity. That's going to be kind of the intro to the approach. Um, then this afternoon, what we'll be doing is talking about how to create lessons and actually creating lessons. It's going to be very hands-on throughout the workshop. You're going to be working as much as we're working, even though this is this very forward-facing moment, we're going to have you talking more throughout the rest of the day, so be prepared. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to be talking about assessment. And this means, on one hand, integrating assessment into those lessons that we're creating, but also how do we assess our lessons. So we're going to come at that from those two different angles. And then tomorrow afternoon, we'll be really talking more about kind of the nuts and bolts about publication. So how do we share these materials? How do we keep that energy going forward? And how do we keep collaborating? Um, what does that look like? And then also, very importantly, um, it, when we're talking about open educational resources, this question of licensing. How do we make sure that when you're sharing, you're getting credit for the work that you've done, and you're giving credit to others for the work they've done while still keeping things very open? So that'll be the focus of tomorrow afternoon. Um, the two resources that I want to point you to just quickly, and I think everyone's online, but we'll hopefully during one of the breaks catch us if you're not or if you have problems with the technology, because we will be using the internet a lot. Um, the first one is the flight website, if you haven't already found that. Um, and so the URL is flite.org. So my question to you for, for, for getting us thinking into this, this question of how do we understand what a flight lesson may or may not be, is just to open up the floor for a moment and to ask you, what does flight mean to you at this point? What are some of your assumptions? What are some of your reactions, responses? Um, what do you think this approach uh, touches on or, or is about or, um, yeah, or some of its objectives? But just as association, if I just take the, I mean, uh, transcription of words, it seems as flight, something is going to ra raise, uh, let's say raise or uh, something, uh, interest or uh, development or levels or whatever. So it's just flying up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So flight is an example of the literary in the everyday, in right. a sense, right? Yeah. The acronym, <laughs> yes, exactly. What I was working with is two fundamental challenges that the field of foreign language teaching and learning is struggling with. Uh, and the first comes from, I mean, my own experiences uh, uh, at a research institution is very much this divide between language and literature that is so anchored uh, in the educational system in the United States. And as it filters down into high school and elementary school, it may seem perhaps, and I don't know because that's not my experience in teaching, it may seem sort of abstracted, but it, is, it runs through the, 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 the spectrum of, of how we think about literacy, how we think about text, reading, writing, uh, et cetera. So bridging that gap, finding ways um, to create sort of curricular coherence, both in terms of content and skills that go from elementary, secondary, uh, into uh, college uh, um, language uh, requirements, into majors in languages, literatures, cultures, and then into graduate programs that are going to be uh, forming teachers to teach those fields, right? How do we create some kind of curricular arc and coherence that, that uh, will uh, hold up throughout? So um, the uh, m sort of multi-literacies approaches and um, text-based approaches are gaining a lot of ground in this area, and flight, of course, falls under that broad umbrella. But there is a second challenge, um, and I think this is where flight takes uh, uh, an interesting spin, um, away, or not away from, but just a, a more uh, specific way from, from uh, multiliteracies. And that is the challenge of moving away from rule-based, form-focused uh, uh, understandings of language and moving into, as many people have mentioned, 
a more systems-based way of working with language that is about meaning and how we make meaning. So all of our textbooks, all of our grammar reference books are still largely within the vein of what can be an inheritance, let's say, from structural linguistics about uh, rules, exceptions to rules, and errors. So how do we, how do we create a, 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 a curriculum that can, that can get us thinking about language differently. And I do have, as far as this conflict, I have a sort of a lighter take on it in the form of a joke for you. So a linguistics professor is lecturing his students one day. And he says, in English, two negatives form a positive. And in other languages, like, like Russian, for example, two negatives remain negative. However, there is no language in which two positives form a negative. And from the back of the room, a voice calls out, yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, the rules and the exceptions to the rules that we, that, that we teach all the time don't come close to adding up to how we make meaning out of language. So this is, this is the challenge, and this is what um, uh, flight, the flight approach hopes to uh, uh, address. And there are many uh, linguistic theories, and many of you, uh, are, some of you are specifically in the field of linguistics in, in various ways. There are many theories that can help us to, to sort of in, inform us in this quest. So the approach that I took that draws from, say, prototype theory and cognitive linguistics uh, is aimed at being an intuitive approach because many of us don't have the time to, to do the equivalent of a new <laughs> degree uh, in a particular linguistic theory that's going to get us where we want to go, right? So we're all very busy, and so I'm trying to plug into intuitions that will help not only us as language teachers, but our students as well. So the idea of the literary in the literary in the everyday is quite uh, different from what we might think of. I, I heard mentioned a lot of times literature. The word literature comes up. But what do we mean by literature? Um, and so the literary in the everyday clearly is about bridging that gap. But it's also about thinking about the notion of the literary in a different way. So um, if we go down to the key terms following things like sociocultural uh, theory and cognitive linguistics, et cetera. Again, the notion of a language not as a computational set of rules and exceptions, but as a system of systems, right, for meaning making. And prototype theory in particular that I find so intriguing really says to us that languages have prototypes for everything from sounds to words to sentences to uh, genres to uh, every level of language. And from those prototypes, we extend and create metaphorical meanings and uses. So it's a very different uh, way of uh, uh, organizing a language. And therefore, the literary, within that context, refers to this plasticity, the plasticity of meaning, the multiple layers of words that words or com more complex uh, structures can convey. Right? Language is plastic, and we subvert it, we remix it, we recontextualize it all of the time in our everyday speech. And every type in every type of speech act or, or written genre. You have um, a list of what we call flight categories, and they're really about metacategories of the literary. So the literary is encapsulating this notion of how we play, how we make meaning out of prototypical forms. So we come to things like genre play, which may involve generating new meaning through genre subversion. So that can be modern fairy tales, or the sort of uh, uh, fractured fairy tale, if you will, or prose poems, or narrative essays. There are many sort of blended genres and multimodal genres. You can work with narrative play. Um, anyway, new takes on familiar storylines, narrative twists, et cetera. Visual play, right? So the literary in the everyday, when we talk about text, it's text in its broadest sense, it, it, from, from the written word to oral to image. Um, so you can subvert uh, meaning through, through visual uh, uh, play. And when it comes to text, that could include punctuation or formatting, right? Visual symbolism, uh, media intertextuality, et cetera. 
grammar play. Now, grammar play is is uh, getting at this notion of oh, we have to rethink or rework how how we how we deal with grammar. So, if you're familiar with the terms foregrounded grammar, um, non-standard grammar in poetry, things like nouns as adjectives, and I'm going to give you an example in a moment. Uh, symbolic play, generating new meaning via symbolism. So that's where things like metaphor, metonymy, uh, digression, etc. Word play, it could be puns, spelling, capitalization. Um, of course, with texting and things like that, we've taken on new dimensions of meaning with capitalization. It's shouting, it's uh, expressing emotion. So how we play uh, even with something as basic as capitalization. What is a platonic form, right? So that, that notion uh, of a capital that expresses uh, a very uh, different meaning than, than the lowercase as well. Sound play. Uh, could be rhyming, homophones, alliteration. Pragmatic play, uh, that gets into register. Mm. Perspective play, points of view, characterization. And finally, culture play, right? How, how, are, <coughs> how is meaning subverted, made anew through playing with uh, practices, values, uh, schemas of products, code switching, multilingualism, et cetera. So our idea was, in order to facilitate people getting into this dimension of language, when you look at a text, because here it's all about, well, how do I find a text that's going to achieve the, the principles or, and embody the principles of where I want to go with, with a flight approach? So you have to start looking at text differently and looking for different things in, in text in order to build a lesson around it. So the idea here is that you have um, a starting point. Uh, something that if you have this, these categories in mind, you can start to then hmm, think about what uh, you might be finding in your text. So I have three nouns here, letter, water, hair. And let's just do a quick, uh, just take a moment and tell me. Let's think about count and mass nouns and tell me how you would um, categorize these nouns and maybe think of, a, a, in your own mind, an example sentence. So, letter, what do, what do you say? Countable. Water? Both. 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 Yeah, both. Can you give me an example? Yeah, if you say water, just like, I mean, tea, uh, tea it can be different types of tea, water, different types of water. Yes. Or if mm -hmm. you say, I want a water, you mean I want a bottle of water. So A means mm -hmm. a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about water in general, so it is uncountable now. Mm -hmm. OK. And even English grammar textbooks, and if you look at romance languages, when it talks about uh, uh, article systems and nouns, break nouns down into one or the other. And then you have these exceptions, like hair in English, that they say can be both. However, if letter is a count noun, how do you get a sentence like, letter was the only form of communication on the island? And if water is a mass noun or a non-countable noun, how do you say things like, um, I'd put together a little uh, uh, plausible exchange at a restaurant. The waiter says, we have a number of waters and beers on tap. What would you like? And the customer says, I'll have a water, right? Which one would you recommend? So the lesson here is that nouns are not one or the other, that all nouns have the potential to express a range of meanings. And what you have to do is to plug into, ah, what are the meanings of, in this case, form. So we can say that letter is prototypically count. Water is prototypically non-count. But adding these very, changing the forms, changing the context, we can generate new meanings if we understand what those meanings are. So it's not about trying to memorize lists of vocabulary. Oh, these are the count nouns. These are the non-count nouns. These are the exceptions. That just leads you to a dead end. You want to give students the tools that, you, that they can play with language and see. So the text in, the flight, uh, in, in a flight lesson is, the, is the, the trigger. It's the thing you have to find if this is what you wanted to teach. You'd have to find a text that's going to give you those examples of language play so that students are working with the full system instead of this little isolated uh, 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 pieces of that larger system and they never get that sense of the system otherwise.